Hello and welcome back. Today we will have a look at the Boeings of Bach's Prelude No. 1 from the cello suites. Just the first four bars, which establish the Boeing patterns for a large part of the Prelude. I mentioned I will use here the term bars for measures or takta. I will compare the manuscripts and some important editions during the history of the suites. Here is my collection. You can see many opinions and varieties exist, because the original has been declared as being lost from quite early on. So here are several editions which I collected, and then there are here several which I copied, including some I copied a long time ago in Germany from libraries. And here are the reprints of the manuscripts by the Bärenreiter edition from 2000. So today we will have a look at, firstly, the four surviving 18th century manuscripts. The four manuscripts are, here just the first four bars, Anna Magdalena, Bach's second wife, Johann Peter Kellner, a friend of Bach, Manuscript C, the first part by a cellist called Schober, and Manuscript D, obviously a cellist, but the name is unknown. Secondly, the following prints. The first print by Norblin, publisher Colette, Paris, and the same by Probst in Leipzig, and published in 1824. The first and second print by Dotzauer, I think they are both 1826. The second Grützmacher edition. And the first eight slurred edition by Hugo Becker, plus the Pablo Casals edition. And some more editions to demonstrate later for certain aspects. Now first to the notes. All editions are the same, no discrepancy, no need to talk about it. Well, it might be confusing looking at all these Boeings, so I put the editions into groups, which have certain Boeing patterns in common. All editions and prints, except of Anna Magdalena, I will talk about that later, share that the first three or four notes are slurred, and in one edition even more. Let's look at the first slur of three or four notes. If you slur the first three notes in a Bach cello with a flatter bridge, it has certain implications. It means we don't play them separate, but like a chord. Oh. And like not, but. It is an arpeggio introducing the suite in G major with a chord of G major. It's not a melody of three separate notes. And the first melodic bar is bar number five. I might mention with a rock bow, it's actually not easy to play it not like a chord. You need to put effort into it. Whereas with our bigger distance of the strings and the higher tension of the bow hair, it comes easy at three notes, but don't do it. Interestingly enough, the menuet starts with exactly these three notes as well, and again indicated as an arpeggio. And it occurs again in the sarabande, and this time as an arpeggio on one beat. And so on. Now to get some order into all this information, I will put two groups together. The first group is four notes slurred, and the second is three notes slurred. The manuscripts by Kellner and manuscript D display the four slurred bowing, as well as does the first print by Norblin. Kellner was a personal friend of Bach, and we can assume that he copied straight away from Bach's original, as 
did Anna Magdalena. By playing through, before slurred, followed, before attached, it leads to that the first slur of four, starting on the first beat, falls on down bow, whereas the second slur in each bar, on the third beat, falls on an up bow. I just play it through. <laughs> heard it, it has a musical implication. And from the Baroque times on, there existed what's called the downbow rule. The first beat in a bar is a strong beat. And if played with a downbow, it has a natural weight, a natural accent, and this became established as an orchestral rule. The first beat, if possible, was a downbow. Of course, exceptions within the context happen. But for example, an orchestral minuet in three beats would be played down on one, two and three in an upbow like and not up. And naturally, the downbow has a natural rate. If applied here, it means every new chord at the beginning of the bar is played stronger. When repeated at the middle of the bar with up bow, it is weaker. And this is another Baroque convention. When a phrase is literally repeated, they apply it either softer or with an ornament, not just repetitive. Here, it brings always out the new harmony. And in the second half of the bar, the repeated harmony comes softer. It sounds more interesting. The structure and progression of harmonies come out clearer. I do it. And so on. That we find the same bowing in the manuscript of copy D confirms that the fourth slurred bowing had been copied during the 50 years in between. The first print by Norblin again shows the same bowing. Reportedly, the cellist Norblin traveled to Leipzig to get hold of a copy, copied it for himself, and quickly published the cello suites in France, and one year later in Leipzig as well, with Probst. And they say, fast, to be earlier than Dotzauer, was in the middle of preparing his first print. Interestingly, Noblin found a copy with four slurred in Leipzig, a different copy than the one Dotzau relied on at the same time. In manuscript D, you can see in bar three that the copier put also a slur on the second group of four, which is usually detached. Why would he do that? Well, in these times there didn't exist white out or another correction fluid. The only option would be to crisscross out, but you can only do it if you notice the mistake straight away. You can't insert a bar later and replace it. Therefore, we find the crisscrossing only when the copier obviously noticed the mistake straight away and wrote the messed bar up again, like here. We need to consider too that a copy was usually done for a person the copier knew face to face. That means simply you could talk to him or her and say, look here, I made a mistake. And the person who had ordered the copy would say, oh, yeah, I can see that. And now I will have a look at the other Boeings except the ones starting with three slurred. I look now at Anna Magdalena's copy. If you slur only the two notes as indicated, then the middle of the bar will start with up bow, the same as when we slur four notes. Uh, by the way, Anna Magdalena forgot the little slur at the end of line one. That no one edited quickly demonstrates for me 
maybe nobody played from that manuscript because wouldn't you edit when you notice it? It's just a copy mistake, like a typo. And if you write it in so you don't forget it for yourself, and otherwise you might make a mistake when you play. Anyway, interestingly, in the fourth bar, Anna Magdalena changes to three slurred, which flows easier and naturally makes the sound bigger. This indicates an implicated dynamic. Starting the prelude softer, the second half of each bar even softer, and go to a fuller sound in bar four, a dynamic development later indicated by several editors. And I might mention here that Anna Magdalena's bowing in the first three bars is really awkward to play, unusual and uncomfortable. It's virtually impossible to play it loud and fast. So I wonder, firstly, she copied certainly from Bach's original. Did he sit with her, asked her to put these unusual bowings in, in order that it's virtually impossible to start in Forte and play too fast? Had he already observed that cellists play, in his opinion, the prelude too fast and too loud at the beginning? And from bar four on, her bowings are similar to other manuscripts. And here's Anna Magdalena's version. <laughs> who included in the editions Anna Magdalena's manuscript, Alexanian, as early as 1929, and Kurtz. But without giving any reason, they both totally ignore her bowings and dismiss them. And there's only one editor, the German cellist Grümmer, published by Doblinger, who faithfully published a well-readable version, not just the manuscript, with exactly and Magdalena's bowings. And now I will go to Hugo Becker, the bowing I learned first, and virtually everyone played his version in the 20th century. Suzuki, Foya, and many others copied it. In his version too, the second part of each bar starts with an up bow, following musically the same pattern as a four slurred version and Anna Magdalena. Why did the eight slurred version become so popular? Well, around 1800, the Frenchman Tort developed the bow as we play it today. Here's a Baroque bow, and I take the other bow, and you can say it goes the other way. And it sounded very different. It made a bigger sound, and with 25 years, everyone played it. The whole instrument got reconstructed. The bass bar under this part of the bridge was stronger, the bridge higher, and with that the fingerboard higher of the instrument. It gave more pressure, bigger sound. And Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 would have hardly had an impact with the old Baroque bow. It would sound nice and light, like Vivaldi. Like, um, let's get my Baroque bow. And would be a and it's like an introduction into Vivaldi. The new bow, in fact, had shaped the imagination of composers to write string music in a new style, with a fuller sound and stronger accent. But despite the fuller sound, it had a downside. With the new bow. Separate strokes got noisier, and the detached notes in the prelude could sound like an unmusical study. I've heard it often like this. You might have noticed I just played the three slurred version. Since Dotsauer, it became the most popular version, and this was the version of most editors before Becker. The cellist Grützmacher then decided, after he was the repeat editor of Dotsauer's version, to publish a new version 
as the second edition is twice three slurred by half bar. Let us play it. <laughs> Anyway, he had a little bit less noise. And a similar decision took later Casals. Only Casals watched that the bow division was much more balanced. <laughs> went all the way and took all the noise out by having no separate bows at all, slurring eight notes for the first half of each bar in down bow, followed by another slur of eight notes in up bow. And so he followed the, at the same time the idea that the second half of each bar was a softer repeat of the first half. And this was the version I learned first. My teacher was an old man when he taught me, and he had been a student of Hugo Becker. And I just played. You probably know this version. And, and so on. And it's very smooth, and with a new bow, he took this noise out. And now I will have a look at the group of three slurred. There's only one manuscript called C with three slurred by a copier called Schober, who certainly had never seen Bach's original. He lived too late. And this copy is from between 1750 to 1799. We don't know. And then, of course, we have the Prince by Dotzauer. Later, the Bach Gesellschaft, or Bach Society, joined Dotzauer, and he continued to today with Bärenreiter, Kurtz, and Icking, the preferred edition, sometimes called the closest to the original. And many performers today, like Julio Ma and Rostopovich, play the three slurred version. I had a funny experience with it. In 2008, I put for the first time a recording of Prelude 1 on YouTube, starting with three slurred. And I got a comment that I played 126 mistakes. And a student had gone through and counted my different bowings to Becker or Suzuki, horrified to see the first time a different bowing than Becker. The three slurred version is technically easier. You can play it faster. Young players like that for showing off. I can play it faster than you. There was no original to be referred to, and chillists with an option, seem to have preferred it. The aspect of playing now faster is interesting and maybe even quite important. Dotsor's first edition indicated as the tempo Allegro Moderato. It must have been, at the time, the way to play it. But having now published the three-third version, it seemed to have an influence. Players seem to have sped up the way of playing Prelude 1 and the indication in the second print is Allegro. I need to mention that in IMSLP Petrucci, where the early manuscripts and prints can be found, the so-called Dotsauer's first edition is in fact the second print. Before IMSLP Petrucci existed, I had contacted Breitkopf and asked if Dotsauer's first print still existed in the archive. They kindly sent me Prelude 1 with the Lego Moderato indication as seen here. And as far as I know, the second edition followed very soon after. The suites became quickly popular. Dotsauer's edition was the first which was thoroughly proofread and consciously edited. It is still very close to the manuscripts. He didn't show off his own ideas, corrected only where he found the manuscript at little mistakes or inconsistencies. You can't play any of the four manuscripts through without correcting and trying to read the mind of the writer, what they meant if they wouldn't have written a mistake. You can play Dotsauer's version through 
without a pencil in your hand, extend slurs, cross others out, and also you end up in a bow direction which feels right. Back to the bowing with three slurred, the disadvantage is certainly in the prelude that the musical structure can get lost. But we need to consider the change of time and thinking between bus time and Dotsawa. Anna Magdalena copies C and D, call the sweets, sweets. Kellner, the earliest copy, calls them suonatas. And they follow in his copy the partitas and sonatas for violin by, by Bach as well. So he took their title. Dotsawa calls them solos or etudes, studies. And just before Noblin called the suites sonatas or etudes. And still Becker called them sonatas in 1911. Suites are a set of dances. Playing the dances requires a knowledge what a character, what the character of the dances was. There are virtually no tempo markings in the suites because the Baroque players all knew. But suites became replaced by the sonata. And in the sonata, each movement has a tempo title like Allegro Moderato. The vision that a dance was something expressive in itself got a bit lost. So the prelude became a bit of an etude using a certain technique instead of a playful introduction, improvisation-like, to a set of dances. Like Dotsauer put dots on the detached notes. There were dots to make it even sharper, which makes it sound even more like a study. But maybe he wanted that. He called the suites solos or studies. And later it's exactly that what Becker avoided. For Dotsauer, these staccato notes were new and exciting. Becker got tired of them. By the way, today probably no one is excited about the noisy bow strokes. But also today we know not only the Baroque bow was responsible for less noise, but also how we hold it. If we hold the bow not at the nut of frog, but go a hand within, we can't do the strong accents. It sounds softer and the noisiness declines immensely. Like if I play here at the nut, and now I put my hand here, where the silver ends. It sounds much softer. So you don't need to buy a baroque bow, you don't need a baroque cello. You go with your hand, a hand within, and it sounds much softer. In particular when you play other movements like the minuet. It suddenly dances, it is softer, and this little bit makes already the difference. As explained in my chat about the Alla Breve movements, Dotsauer dismissed all Alla Breve markings. There was no connection to the old dances anymore. Tempo education had replaced the understanding of a dance. We need not to forget that Schubert died just two years after Dotsauer's first edition. Times had changed and bypassed Haydn, Beethoven and Mozart. Performance was now showing off on stage. In the time of Bach, the old suites were cheerful house music, instrumental dances played in the player's home. Now back to the comparison. In my view it looks like that the four-slurred version was the first, particularly considering Johann Kellner was a personal friend of Bach and copied very likely from nothing else than Bach's original. You can see the handwriting of the four-slurred versions that often the bowings are written high up or not long enough. In fact, sometimes the slur goes only over three notes and the three slurred option is not an impossible reading. Like at the beginnings of bar one and two of manuscript D, where just common sense tells us he meant four. But some might have found it just easier, suggested it, like editors suggest Boeing's today. 
And then the copy fell into the manuscript Shoba, writer's C's hand, with three slurred, and one of these copies fell in Dotsau's hand. And at the same time, a four slurred version fell into Norblin's hand. Well, how did it then happen that the four slurred version didn't become the preferred version of history, conscious editors, or of history conscious performers, at least in the 21st century. As mentioned, copier's copy was by far superior, neater, no mistake, maybe some notes incorrect as we know today, but he didn't know. But Dot Sauer is a long time ago. Why has knowing the manuscript not changed anything? Like Kurtz and Alexanian print even a whole manuscript out and don't even comment why they ignore it. It's an interesting question. In my view, it has to do with so-called schools being caught up in their traditions. Information accessible to us today does not mean we are influenced by it. The tradition of schools is stronger. Well, what do I mean with schools? In instrumental teaching, it has always existed and still exists today. And I explain from my personal experience. When I started studying tertiary and asked if I could play a Bach suite, I was given the Bach copy from my teacher to take home and copy his fingerings and bowings. These fing fingerings and bowings were the bowings and fingerings of his teacher, a teacher which I would call the Grandmaster, and in my case it was Janusz Stucker. All of the Grandmaster's students copied them, his markings, became teachers, and it continued. Why is it like this? Well, when I started to play the suite, my teacher could play the suite by memory, no mistake, well in tune, good sound. The grand teacher had done several recordings of the suites, immaculate performed and a tour of the world performing them. So it would be really hard, as little me just starting, sit and say, I can't play it yet well, neither Boeings and notes, but I really want to take different Boeings. And I would have worried about an answer from my teacher like, don't you like how I played? Then why do you study with me? So literally hundreds of students play the same until one like me decides after finishing my studies to go through the confusing stage, I want to change my bones and fingerings. I rub out, start again and give away much of what I have remembered. I know I will mix up the old and the new versions, but I want to go through that. If nothing better to do, makes life interesting. And I'm not alone. There's an anecdote of Misha Maisky, a famous Bach interpreter. A friend plays a Bach suite recording of him and asks him for his opinion. Maske says, interesting, not bad at all. I would though play differently. Who is it? And friend says, it's you. Many go through the process of changing again and again, and it is interesting when it's continuously new views and new ideas. Back to the schools, the tradition of copying was even stronger when the only existing manuscript was a copy of the Grandmaster. You couldn't buy another version. You copied the only available one with all the opinions attached. It can just be a coincidence that Dot Sauer had got hold of a copy like C, copied it and it got published for the next 130 years. And it looks like quite a lot more of three slurred version copies had circulated around Leipzig because there have been about a dozen other editions. The first print by Cotel, Probst, have never seen a second print run. It included too many obvious mistakes, like wrong movement names, inconsistent bowings, so its influence was minimal, although it was famously Casal's first copy. And lastly, I wish to point out that the today known four manuscripts from the 18th century had been held in collections, and there's no sign they had ever been used. The manuscripts which players played from 
had probably naturally worn through, fell apart and had been replaced as soon as printed copies appeared. And when they had a different copy, they made sure and tried that their copy was the next print. And once they were printed, they threw the old print away, the old copy away. It looks very much like that the only manuscripts which survived were the ones which no one used, no one looked at, no one copied from, and that's why they survived, until they reappeared in museums in the 20th century. And that's for today. And if you're interested in more chats on the Barcello Suites, there's a collection on my Patreon site. And I might mention, there are links to recordings of mine with the versions of three slurred, like Dot Sauer, then with four slurred, like the manuscript D, and the Becker version. And goodbye for now.